when the Buddha defined suffering or stress in the Four Noble Truths. He gave lots of examples and then summarized them all as five clinging aggregates. And notice he didn't say five aggregates, it's the clinging aggregates that are suffering. It's because we cling to them that the mind suffers. They may have stress simply in the fact that they arise and pass away, but they don't really inflict the mind unless the mind clings to them. And so we have to understand what this clinging is and how we can get past it. First off, it's good to notice that the word clinging also means taking sustenance. For example, when they talk about a plant growing, it requires sustenance from the soil, or fire requires sustenance from its fuel. So in clinging to something, we're actually trying to feed off of it. And as the Buddha points out in many places, this act of feeding really is stressful. And it's part of taking on the identity of being a being, as you've got to feed. You feed on material food, but you also feed on emotional and mental food as well. And here the clinging is a metal kind of feeding. And one of the purposes of the practice is to teach us how to get past our hunger for these things. The part of the mind that really likes to feed. In many places the Buddha talks about developing a sense of nibbida, which can be translated as disenchantment, but also in stronger cases can actually mean disgust and revulsion. In other words, you see you've been eating a certain kind of food and you just can't take it anymore. You lose all taste for that food. This is why the Buddha teaches the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self. So we can actually look at what we're eating. In one passage of the Buddha talks about seeing that you've got this liquid, tastes like honey, it's very attractive, very tasty. You keep eating the honey, and then you discover it's got poison in it. So the next time you see it, would you want to eat it? The knowledge that it's poisonous would be enough to make you not even want to touch it to your lips. And so this is what the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, not self, are intended for, is to develop that sense of no longer wanting to eat these things. It seems that they don't provide the satisfaction that, that you think that they would provide. But those aren't the only perceptions he has you apply. Sometimes there's a perception of, as he says, seeing these things as a wound, a dart, a cancer, a void, a dissolution. In other words, any kind of perception that helps you see that when you really look at these things carefully, they're not worth eating. They're not worth taking in. So that's the process of what we're doing here as we practice, is look at our eating habits. And then as part of the path, we're trying to feed ourselves on better things. We actually take the aggregates and we feed on them to some extent, but it's a different kind of feeding. We take them as a path. We convert our form, feelings, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness into a state of concentration. We use the fabrication of thoughts to develop wisdom, the perceptions that the Buddha recommends to develop wisdom, and also the purpose of that wisdom being to develop the sense of dispassion and disenchantment. And we feed the mind with conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, all of which are good food for the mind. That's what strengthens us so that we can manage the path. So it's not that the Buddha is trying to starve us right from the start, but he just says take a different approach to your feeding. Feed on good food first, until the mind is strong enough that it doesn't need any food anymore.
then as part of the process, he has you look very carefully at what is this feeding that you do? How do you feed? This is part of the, the duty with regard to stress and suffering, which is to comprehend it. You want to comprehend the clinging. The Buddha actually identifies four ways in which we cling to the aggregates. The first is through sensual passion. We like beautiful things. That's the form there. But we also like thinking about how much we're going to enjoy the beautiful things and the things that sound nice and smell nice and taste nice and feel nice when we touch them. Those are perceptions, fabrications. So sensuality isn't just over material things. It's in fact the primary issue in sensuality. So the mind wants to think about these things over and over again. It can obsess about food, about sex, and whatever else the pleasures might be. And that's what it's actually addicted to, is, is the obsession, the obsessing about the thoughts. And this is why, as an antidote, the Buddha has all those images to think about. Well, what do you actually get out of sensuality? He compares sensuality to a bead of honey on a knife blade. You take the bead of honey, you don't want to lick it up, but you cut your tongue. Or carrying a torch against the wind. You like the light from the torch, but the fact that the wind is blowing it at you, you're going to get burned. Or of a man being up in a tree, eating the fruits of the tree, but someone else comes along and doesn't want to climb the tree, so wants to cut it down. In other words, you have certain sensual pleasures, but other people want those pleasures too, and they're going to destroy you in the process of getting those pleasures. So he wants you to reflect on how dangerous and harmful these pleasures are. Similar images of a, of a hawk got a piece of meat, and other hawks and kites and other raptors come up and fight it to snatch that piece of meat away. And if the original hawk doesn't let go, it's going to get torn to pieces, too. So there are lots and lots of images the Buddha has to impress on you how much danger there is in sensuality. So that's one of the antidotes for that kind of feeding. Another way that we cling to the aggregates is through views. Views about ourselves, views about the world. The Buddha doesn't mention politics, but that certainly is a way that people cling to cling to views. And it creates a lot of suffering. Because once you start clinging to the views, you get into arguments. And this, this is one of the reasons why the Buddha was so selective in the questions that he answered, because a lot of the questions lead just to more clinging and more conflict. And a lot of these issues are things you simply cannot resolve, like the origin of the world or other speculations about the nature of the cosmos. He says you can go crazy thinking of these things. Other issues about who you are, what you really are, what is a person. The Buddha never answered those questions. Now there are some views that are useful, right views dealing with the issue of stress and its cause, and the path to the end of stress. Those are views that you have to hold on to. Again, they're like the raft that'll take you across the stream, and then you can let go. But there are lots of other views that you really don't need to have opinions on. This I found when I went to Thailand was one of the more liberating parts about becoming a monk. Back when I was in college, you were expected to have a view on every topic that people brought up. Whereas over there, being a monk, it wasn't necessary. In fact, it was frowned on. Lots of unnecessary discussions. So you want to focus your, your views on things that are really conducive to the end of stress. Not hold on to the kinds of views that just keep you tied down. A third kind of clinging is to habits and practices. The word habit here is the translation of sila. Sometimes it's 
translated as precepts or rites and rituals. But it's more than that. It's basically the idea that any habitual way of acting is going to, in and of itself, guarantee you awakening or guarantee that you're going to be pure or superior, or and put it into suffering simply by following rules. And there are rules that we follow, and there are practices that we have. We practice concentration, we follow the precepts. But again, it's with the purpose of giving rise to insight. The rules and the, the precepts and the practices in and of themselves don't constitute awakening. They form a basis for it. But you've got to practice them in a way that you're not simply following the rules and hoping that by putting the mind through a sausage factory you're going to come out with enlightenment without having to use any of your own powers of observation, without adjusting things, without testing things and experimenting. So again, you want to look at the habits that are actually getting in the way and your attitudes towards habits and precepts and practices that are getting in the way of letting go. And you're trying to let go of them as much as you can because they do tie you up. And again, the Buddha wants you to see how much you get tied up. By your habitual ways of doing things. And then he teaches you better habits that will get you to a point where you don't need the habits anymore. The Buddha talks about the person who gains the first stage of awakening is, is still virtuous when you are no longer attached to your habits. It's not that you will do anything at all and you realize the harm that comes from breaking the precepts. But the precepts don't become part of your identity, and I think that's the main issue the Buddha is getting at. You don't exalt yourself and disparage others over your precepts, saying, well, they're not as virtuous as I am. Remember when I was a small child? My mother's president of the PTA and the principal of the school, who was also the first grade teacher, would sometimes stop by the house after school and have discussions. And One day after their discussion was over, Mom came and reported at the dinner table that the teacher who was Catholic had made the remark that, well, if being Catholic doesn't make you better than other people, what good is it? And I, of course, had been raised to think that being Catholic didn't make you any better than anybody else. It really did seem out pretty stupid. I was surprised that my teacher could say something so stupid. Even I, as a first grader, could see it was stupid. So what, you, what we want to do is we're practicing. We're not here to be better than other people. It's like we have a disease and we're trying to apply the right medicine. And the fact that other people are not applying their medicine, that's not a issue of whether you're better than they are or not. And you're not doing it to make yourself better than they are. You're making, doing it to make yourself well. And so once you've had your first taste of awakening, you see the precepts are an, an important part of the path, but there is more to the path than just that. Then you realize it's not that you're following the precepts to make you better than other people. It's simply it's what you need to do if you don't want to suffer. The fourth kind of clinging is clinging to doctrines of the self and beliefs about what you are. Do you exist? Do you not exist? That's part of the series of questions the Buddha says don't deserve any attention. Do I exist? Am I? Am, am I not? What am I? How am I? And then there are the related questions. When a person gains awakening, does that person exist or not exist? Both or neither? Because that gets to the idea of okay, what is it deep down in the core that experiences awakening. And this is probably one of the strongest types of clinging, is we have our ideas about who we are. And we hold on to them tight. And when you identify with something, as the Buddha says, when that thing begins to change, you suffer. I mean, just look at aging, illness, and death. If you're identifying with a body, 
you're going to suffer for sure. If you identify with your feelings, if you identify with your perceptions and thought constructs, you know, as your mind stops remembering things so well, there's going to be a lot of suffering. And so one of the whole points of the practice is to begin to see that your sense of self is, is an activity. You have a strategy for trying to make yourself happy, and you create this sense of self around the aggregates based on two things. One is your idea of well, who is it that's going to receive the pleasure that you're trying to create. And then secondly is, well, what do you have under your power that you can use to create that pleasure? It's like a little child. Learning that this shape that appears in its field of vision every now and then is actually a hand that it controls. So then it starts using that hand to grasp things. And its instinctive reaction is grasp and you put it in your mouth. You want to eat things, see what's good to eat. And it's around that kind of activity that your sense of self develops, both the self as the producer and the self as the consumer. And so, as with the other forms of clinging, the Buddha has you learn how to use that strategy of self to get yourself on the path. The self is producer. The thought that other people can do this, why can't I? And then you look at yourself to see what qualities you need in order to practice, and so you try to develop them. You're very aware, as the Buddha says, you want to be aware of your level of conviction, your virtue, your generosity, your discernment, your level of learning, your level of ingenuity. Have you developed these skills to the point where they really can lead to awakening? And as for the self as consumer, if you ever feel tempted to leave the path, you remind yourself, hey, I got on this path to begin with because I was suffering. I wanted true happiness. Don't I love myself? Don't I really want true happiness? Or am I going to let myself be content with second best, or not even second best, you know, way down at the bottom of the list? These are skillful ways of using your sense of self. And you realize you have to be responsible for your actions and having a sense of heedfulness, realizing that if you don't act properly, you're going to suffer. These all require a sense of self that's healthy, mature, and it can take you a fair way on the path, but it doesn't take you all the way. When you begin to see that it's the one thing that's keeping you from being free or preventing freedom, because you've learned how to see things simply as causes and effects, and you begin to see there are certain actions that get in the way, so you learned how to abandon those actions and replace them with better ones. Do you see the only thing that's standing in the way is the fact that you're identifying a sense of self that's experiencing these things. You try to locate where that is, where it's centered. When you see where it's located and how it forms a, a nucleus for your, this state of becoming, which you have an idea of who you are or where you are, what kind of world you're in. Once you can see that happening and you can drop it, that's the end of the matter. That's the end of all clinging. So this is how the Buddha teaches the issue of clinging, how he explains suffering and stress. This is how, this is how we come to comprehend it. In other words, he has you look at your feeding habits for the mind, and notice where they're unskillful, and how you can replace them with more skillful feeding habits, particularly in terms of your views and your habits and practices, and your sense of who you are. You try to develop those in a skillful way so that eventually they lead you to the point where you don't need them anymore. The mind is strong enough that it doesn't need to feed. That's when it really lets go. There's no more clinging, no more feeding. It's the end of suffering, and it's total release. And as for the question of who's experiencing that release, 
John Swett had a nice way of responding. He said, when, you've, when there is the experience of true release, it doesn't really matter to you who or what is experiencing it. The experience is enough in and of itself. <laughs>